My guest today is Matt Groves. Matt, how are you? Hey, David. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on the show again. Uh, it's great to have you back. Um, you're still doing the same thing, right? What are you doing? Yeah, I'm still at uh, Couchbase. I'm um, technically in the marketing team now, but I'm still very much a developer-facing uh, person, still still coding a little bit here and there. Yeah. Uh-huh. What do you want to talk about today? Well, I thought it might be interesting to talk about uh, migrations. I, I work with a database company, and uh, mm-hmm. I think migrations are an interesting topic for other developers who work with migrations. Yeah, database migrations in particular. Yeah, right. So what, what I don't mean by migrations is moving from one database to another. Like, I don't mean MySQL to Postgres, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, what I'm talking about is uh, schema migrations, I guess, would be one way to talk about it. Going from my database now to my database after I write this new feature, that sort of thing. Oh, okay. So more about uh, upgrading, like, uh, like we upgrade our code, we put our code in version control. And, right. And... Uh, write some new code, and then we want to push that code out at the same time. And often our code depends on, the change our code depends on changes in the database as well. We want to sync those together. Absolutely. Right. Exactly how that works. And uh, when, I, you know, when I say schema, um, it could mean schema, like a table structure or something, but it could also mean some data in there, and it just could be structure in general, um, mm-hmm. uh, data functionality. Um, so anything that you want to make changes to the database to support a feature is what a migration would be for. Okay. Is there is there a canonical solution to this problem, or are there options, I mean, or what? Yeah, there's there's lots of options for it. I think the first one that I ever heard of was from Ruby on Rails, just a built-in migrations framework. I think that's mm-hmm. uh, was pretty well known at the time and inspired a lot of other uh, frameworks out there that are very similar, right? Um, so. The one I, I'm most familiar with is uh, Fluent Migrations, or is it Fluent Migrator? I can never get that straight. One of the other, Fluent uh, Migrator. I had the GitHub page up a second ago. It's probably still here. Fluent yes. Migrator is the name of the GitHub project. Okay, okay. Fluent, migrate, and then whatever suffix you want to add. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so, uh, and what, uh, so how does that work? What, is, uh, what does Fluent Migrator do? Yeah, so with Fluent Migrator, it's it's similar to the Rails approach or even Entity Framework approach where you're going to create a series of classes in c and each one of those classes is going to be labeled with a, a number or some sort of um, instruction for the ordering. And then within those classes, you have two functions you have to override and, and write code for. One of them is up and the other one is down. Uh, mm-hmm. So up is where you're going to actually make changes to the database, like create table or add column, things like that. Right. And then the down would be how to revert that. So instead of create table, you want to drop table. Or instead of add column, you want to remove column, that sort of thing. So, And then when you're done, you have a series of those uh, classes. You know, uh, I've had up to 50 or 60 before in, in smaller projects where... Um, the actual runner is going to go through and parse each of those, run the ones that haven't been run already, and get them all the way to a current state, or you know whatever state you want to get them to. And you can also roll back to a, a known state as well. Hmm. Okay. So this one is more of a, a imperative approach to it. In other words, you're telling it exactly what code to run to get to a current state, as opposed to some systems that are uh, uh, declarative, where you say, here's the current state, figure right. out how to get there. Right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So I would create, uh, if today I'm creating a user profile, I'm going to create one, one migration that's going to create table users with column X, Y, Z. Tomorrow, if I'm creating an invoice system in the same project, I'm going to have another migration, create table invoice with columns A, B, C, and, and so on as I keep going. Okay, and that's the one that you use. Um, What's, uh, uh, I imagine you have to, uh, th- there's no way to skip a step and, and you do this. Or there's a, in other words, if you go from version 1 to version 3, you must do version 2 first, or almost certainly have to do version 2 first. Well, that's, that's the generally, that's the uh, happy path approach, right? Now, there are some situations where you may want to run certain migrations depending on your environment. If I'm in the dev mm-hmm. environment, then run this script, or if I'm in test environment, run this script. And there's, 
Uh, Fluent Migrator has different tags you can use to define those or, or parameters you can pass in, things like that. But for the most part, yes, you're going to go in the order of the whatever order you label these migrations with, typically a number, but it could be a string or whatever, too. Got it. Uh, you've written a whole series of articles on your blog at crosscuttingconcerns.com uh, about how you use Fluent Migrator. Tell me about That's some right. of the lessons that you've learned and best practices. Yeah, uh, well, I never like to say best practices because, uh -huh. uh, you know, whatever practice uh, is, is good, um, it, it works for your team, that's, that's your best practice, right? But right. some of the things that I learned uh, while I was uh, working with Fluent Migrator is, uh, you know, it's not the perfect tool. It's not going to solve every issue, and, and there are trade-offs to any tool, of course. But uh, one of the ones that I think was the biggest one for me was um, – sprocks and views and store and uh, triggers and things like that some database functionality that you know fluent migrator was really great for creating tables and modifying tables uh, indexes and things like that but when you're actually going to change uh, a sprock from my sprock today to my sprock tomorrow that gets pretty awkward to do um, so it's not a great tool for that. Now, fortunately, I'm of the mind that I want to keep as much functionality out of the database as possible, right? Keep business logic out of there if I can. But some situations you just have to write a sprock for performance reasons or for centralization reasons or, or whatever. So it's not the best tool for that. Now, there is a way you can have Fluent Migrator run a SQL script, right? Just to have just check in a SQL text file and Fluent Migrator can run that. But Again, the issue is what happens when I need to make a change to that. Now, do I create a whole second script and replace that, or do I update the existing script uh, and lose the history? So it gets kind of awkward and a little cumbersome when you're dealing with that functionality. So be on the lookout for that. Okay. Well, that's an interesting point that uh, generally we rely on source control to manage the history of these things. Do we? Uh, it, how does source control play into these tools? Right, so with, uh, with Fluent Migrator, you, you still just check these in the source control, just, the, just alongside your code, maybe in the same project or same solution, that sort of thing. Right, but the, the issue there is, you know, if I make a, uh, let's say a sprock, a SQL file, I call it Matt Sprock, and it has certain logic in it, I check in that SQL file, I create a Migrator class to run that sprock, right? Tomorrow, I realize that, oh, I forgot to do something in that sprock, so I have to make a change to that sprock, uh, if I make a change to that one Sprock text file, the next person who comes in and runs it, you know, they're going to, they're not going to go through the same history. They're going to be just the latest version of the Sprock. So that makes it very hard for them to peg it to a certain version in the migration history if they need to. So the other approach would be I'd create a whole separate, I call it Matt Sprock 2. Uh, and so now I've got basically a, a uh, source control history within my source control history. So it, it gets kind of cumbersome to take that approach. So there's not really a super comfortable way to do that with a tool like this. So it's just gets, it's awkward either way, unfortunately. Okay. I'm <coughs> poking around on the source code of Fluent Migrator. I know it looks like it's written in C Sharp. Is, right. uh, does it matter what, uh, what database that I'm using with yeah, this so Migrate Social? Yeah, that's one of the great things about Fluent Migrator is that it supports a lot of different databases. So SQL Server, of course, all the way back to 2000, um, Postgres, MySQL, Oracle, even even if you want to use uh, with uh, Access, with the Jet Engine, you can do that too, or cool. DB2, things like that. So that's one great thing about this Oracle as well. A lot of uh, databases are supported there. Okay. Yeah, I see it looks like a different folder for each one, so they explicitly implemented MySQL, Oracle, Postgres. No Fox Pro, I'm going to say. <laughs> glaring omission, well, if there's in my a, opinion. Well, there's an ODBC connector, we can probably make it work. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it actually highlighted another issue with uh, Fluent Migrator, is that it's great that it supports all these databases, but if there is some database-specific feature, let's say Oracle implements some new uh, widget or whatever, um, Fluent Migrator may not support that out of the box, right? Because it's trying to su give broad support, not right. necessarily specific support to each one. So it may lag behind in some of those database-specific features. If there's a, something new in Postgres, for instance, you may not have that right away with Fluent Migrator. So another thing to look out for. Okay. Uh, tell me about the, uh, the CICD story around this. I want to build this as part of my deployment, my automated deployment. What do I yeah. need to do? Right, so I think um, what, what we did, uh, the last project I was on, is with Fluent Migrator, there's actually a 
command line runner program um, to, to run the migrations. And that's what you do as a developer. You'd run that on your machine to get your database, your local database up to snuff with the current state of the project, right? And so that's what you can do with your CI CD pipeline is you can uh, just run that executable on your, on your CI server or whatever and uh, connect to a database. It'll make changes directly to the database, um, you know, during your build process or commit or whatever it is. Um, that's actually another uh, complaint um, about migrator tools in general is with, with uh, if you're working with DBAs especially, right, they don't necessarily, uh, you know, they, they want to see the actual SQL being generated, whereas this tool is a bit of an abstraction. Like I'm, I, I'm saying create table. Behind the scenes, what that's going to do is it's going to create a SQL script. Um, I don't know what that SQL script is, right? So that might be uh, something a DBA is maybe a little bit opposed to is, you know, you're, you're, you're running SQL, you don't necessarily know what the SQL is doing behind the scenes. So uh, one other option you can do with Fluent Migrator, I just learned about this recently, is there is an output option. So instead of running against the database directly, Fluent Migrator can actually output a SQL script for you, a full mm -hmm. SQL script. And so that's something you can give to a DBA, uh, or you can just look at it yourself and maybe check that script in after some tweaks or whatever and run that script against your your um, test database or your staging database or whatever before you make it to production. Uh, I see. So there are manual steps involved, which implies that it's, it's not going to be a fully automated deployment, which makes it a little bit harder to sync up with your uh, your your code, your calling code, you know, your dependent code. Well, you can, you can make it fully automated for sure. If you want to run that uh, command line directly, right, have the CI script run that command line directly. But the risk there might be that, you know, you're running SQL against production that, as a developer, I didn't write the SQL, right, as DBA right. didn't look at the SQL. So you might want to introduce some manual steps, a DBA review, that sort of thing, if you want to make sure the SQL hitting production isn't going to take down production. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, DBAs tend to be a cautious lot, is my, my experience, though. So. <laughs> Probably uh, for good reason. Yeah, there's, there's, there's advantages to that. <laughs> They're a necessary speed bump. <laughs> uh, very cool. Where, uh, now, where do you learn about this? Where does a, somebody that's new to this, like myself, uh, yeah. learn more about Fluent Migrator? I mean, I would start with the Fluent Migrator website. It's great documentation, fluentmigrator.github.io, and it shows you a, a quick example of how it works right there on the home page. You can get into the the details of it. The great thing about Fluent Migrator, and this is one of the things I like about it specifically, is the Fluent syntax, which means once you get started with it in Visual Studio or Writer or whatever, you get that IntelliSense, those little code hints that kind of give you options for once you get started. So it's a little bit easier to discover the different functionality as you go along. I don't know if you remember the big Fluent trend, um, you know, what is it, 10 years ago or whatever, where everything sure. was Fluent this and Fluent that. But so you had these a lot of those statements that were sort of chained together. Right, right. Yeah. And a lot of those libraries have kind of fell off or gone away, but Fluent Migrator is one that's stuck around, and I think uh, for good reason that Fluent Syntax makes a lot of sense in this context. Very cool. Is there anything we haven't covered that you feel is important? Well, one of the things I thought bring up about Fluent Migrator, it's not a, a new technology or anything. It's been around for a long time. But one of the things I'm working on, uh, because I work for a NoSQL company, is bringing this same kind of functionality to a, to a NoSQL developer, like a Couchbase developer. Um, oh, is Fluent Migrator only for relational databases? Yes. Right now, it is only a relational database uh, tool. Um, okay. I, I've had some discussions with the organizer about bringing NoSQL to it, but you know, there's lots of challenges with that. A lot, a lot of differences in NoSQL databases. Um, in terms of what they call things and the different APIs and stuff. So okay. that can be very challenging. But So that's why I kind of started uh, a separate project. This is not a fork or anything like that. It's not, uh, it's not affiliated with the project at all. Um, but I, I call it NoSQL Migrator. It's very much inspired by a Fluent Migrator. Um, now, with, with a NoSQL database, it's a lot less structure. There's no schema there. But there still is some structure, right? Uh, so I think it's important to you know, provide a tool that can help developers communicate with their team about here's the structures that we need to keep building this feature and, and check them into source control, just like a relational database. So that's why I created this project. It's very much in early stages. Um, but if you're interested in that, if you're interested in NoSQL, uh, you know, check it out on GitHub. And, uh, um, you know, happy to uh, have conversations about that, open issues, all that kind of good stuff is, is there. It's very early stages, but... Uh, Check it out. That sounds interesting to you. Okay. I'm looking at it right now. Uh, GitHub.com slash mgroves, 
slash no SQL migrator. That's right. Uh, and there's a readme file here and a bunch of source code as well. Um, excellent. <clears throat> um, are you uh, doing any speaking in the near future? Yeah, I'm going to be at uh, DevNexus in April, I believe. So DevNexus.com. Um, that's a great event. It's very uh, Java-centric, but you've never been to DevNexus? It's a great event. Uh, that's the one in Atlanta, is that right? Yes, that's right, Atlanta, Georgia World Congress. Uh, it's a great event. I've been there uh, many times uh, as a sponsor and as a speaker, and I will be both uh, again this year. So looking forward to that in April. Matt, thank you so much. This has been really educational for me. Thanks for having me. David, I asked ChatGPT to help me with this one. Technology has made it easier to stay in touch with friends, but it's also made it easier to pretend we're not home. <laughs>